adds a story. Sadie likes to make boats out of boxes. Some. I do. Just haven't been written yet. I see a ballerina. Yeah. At this Atlanta bookstore, Me? the kids can't hold back their excitement. <laughs> <laughs> you tacky and vaguely round monstrosity. <laughs> their imagination captivated. May I have a cookie, please? <laughs> by today's guest reader. My name is Edie Cheeseburger, and I am a drag queen. Does anybody know what a drag queen is? No? Looking swell, Manny. It's usually adults listening to Edie. Here we go, girl. Wow, how's everybody doing tonight? How's that chicken finger? <laughs> Taking in the racy drag show in Buckhead. But Edie is now flipping the script. Oh, there's more. Keeping a PG performance for younger crowds. Look at all the cookies you guys. Who in here likes cookies? While sharing a story they've never heard before. I will pinch you and make you cry, Rock Warrior! <laughs> in more ways than one. I think it's a really great step to kind of normalize it for children. Are you not entertained? <laughs> Parents seem to agree. When I was a kid, I didn't know anybody who was like openly LGBT, and I think it's you know really wonderful that young kids who are growing up now can sort of grow up just understanding you know, different types of people. When nights are black and when days are gray, you'll be brave and bright so no shadows can stay. A moment of brightness in a dark world. Um, and if that's progressive, then I'm here for that. <laughs> this new chapter in Edie's life? She's not inside the box at all. Helping imprint new lessons. I'm not here to push some weird agenda or whatever. I'm here to entertain. On anyone willing to just sit. Turkeys are silly. And listen. I get to be the better version of myself, and I get to reach out and tell my story and touch a lot of people's lives. Hopefully, um, going forward, people are more open-minded and they're um, less afraid to ask questions about people who are different. When I look at you and you look at me, I wonder what wonderful things you will be. A character in a real life story. Thank you guys for being such a good audience. With a twist ending few saw coming. You guys are awesome. Do you enjoy that? In Atlanta, I'm Adam Harding, CBS 46 News. With every passing hour, Hurricane Irma is inching closer. And in Bainbridge, just stuffed them up against under there. It's a countdown to save pieces of history. Our history goes way back in the 1800s. A downtown on full display, not unlike what's inside the local museum. We didn't board up. Um, we hope we'll be okay. We met Jacob Polsky as he sat outside Sunday, warning families where to seek shelter. We just wanted to make sure everybody passing through knew where they could go. It's not, not too hard on us to, to offer that. We've talked to a couple of people about power, and that's kind of a big concern. The storm only recently began tracking this far west. Not many businesses are secured. Still, all are hoping they're not blown away. I still feel prepared um, for myself. I'd say I'm concerned for others that maybe they didn't, you know, I think everybody kind of thought, you know, have food and water for a couple of days, but, you know, should we be out of power? I I'm concerned that others might not have prep for that many days. It's like a waiting game. You don't know what it's big or when it's coming. Alicia Goss and her family are spending the night at the Decatur County Coliseum. This is our first time experiencing something like this, so and it's not that bad, but it's pretty okay. They're sitting, waiting, under the hum and glow of the gymnasium lights. I know she was telling me today, she told me that, you know, Irma has already, you know, got all the water from out of the Bahamas. You know, I never known for a hurricane to do anything like that. So just knowing that she is a really strong, you know, storm and capable of things like that, we just don't know what to expect. We, we really don't know. Probably won't sleep tonight. I probably won't. I probably won't. So I hope she took a nap today because she's going to have to keep me up. <laughs> As the winds pick up along Tybee Island. We have a beautiful beach, you know. A moment of peace for Anthony Stevenson. It's not, it's not that bad yet, but it's going to get bad. It's not exactly the calm before the storm. 
hope for the best, you know, that nothing go wrong. <coughs> you got it, Glenn. At the sand bar. That's her. The boards are going up. You want to come to me a little? As Irma inches closer. We're staying here. We're going to ride this thing out. Riding the storm out, on Tommy. <laughs> I wouldn't stay. If it, was, if it was a good Category 3 or a Category 4, I would not or above. I wouldn't stay on this island. Jay Altman and his friends working nonstop to prepare for whatever comes their way. Jason, how many sheets of ply would you think you put up the last couple of days? At least 100. At least 100. <laughs> In downtown Savannah, the signs are clear. Irma isn't a welcome guest. You got another handicap coming to you, Spain. We found a line of school buses pulling into the Civic Center early Saturday, ready to evacuate thousands to Augusta. This uh, life or death situation. Everybody's saying that Irma going the other way, but it could always, you know, turn back and hit us. So they're being safe and sorry. We did I get some water to some of the buses. They're stocking up on water for their trip. Uh, I'm gonna bring you one more, okay? Might as well be safe. In the, they don't need trying to ride it out in the house. Kafis Powell didn't hesitate at the chance to head north. I don't want to see this town go down like Houston went down, what, a couple of weeks ago now? You know, and that's what I'm worried about. The latest tracking has the storm moving away from the coast. The governor announcing contraflow on I-16 is no longer needed. The one thing about hurricanes, they're unpredictable. For now, those who chose to stay can only wait and watch. Water camera at the dome there. CBS 46's Adam Harding brings you the sights and sounds and a look back at some of the dome's biggest moments. It's a monster of a send-off. You know, I've never been to Atlanta. And for Todd LaDuke. And I love to go fast. His first drive in the Georgia Dome will also be his last. I want to put on the best show I can. I want to say that I was the last person to win here and go home and just always have that memory in my mind. He's a gearhead revving his engine. Literally jumping for joy. Ahead of this weekend's final show at the city's iconic stadium. I don't think it is scary at all. I've had moments where I'm sitting there going, should I do it? No, don't do it. Oh, maybe that'd be kind of cool. You'd be a hero if you did do it. So, no, I've had those moments, but I never shut my eyes. Everyone knows it's the last weekend ever in the Georgia Dome. This will be Keith Jones' third time hosting the show in Atlanta. It's going to be a big weekend. He's hoping this stadium goes out with a bang. It's a very special moment for everyone that's going to be here, from the fans down to the drivers. You know, it's hard to believe that after 25 years, the Georgia Dome is closing up for good. For more than two decades, it has been an institution here in downtown Atlanta. A lot of us probably think it's home to the Atlanta Falcons, but in all of its time being here, it has hosted so much more. We went back to the archives and found the finishing touches being put on the dome's roof. 16 years later, a twisting tornado tested it. Fans were sent running. Who could forget Hollywood dreamers camping outside to be rock stars? Or when real rock stars took to the stage? And can anyone forget this sight? What do you think? Oh. Whoa! 25 years of history, now one last show for the iconic Georgia Dome. It is going to be a pretty magical moment. You know, like, right now it's not setting in that, you know, after 25 years, you know, that the building's being shut down and nothing else is going to be performed here. In Atlanta, I'm Adam Harding, CBS 46 News. It's the kind of Georgia small town where you just know everyone. And at the tiny home, welcoming you to Grammy and Pops. Oh, let me share it with you. My Bible is marked up. There's a local pastor turning heads. <laughs> Meet Horace Sheffield. I'm an ordained Baptist preacher. Who at 88 just graduated college for the first time. I walked on the stage, I got a standing ovation. You just have to be there. Horace finished high school in the 40s. He tried college in the 60s, but life got in the way. There are me and her are up there. 
He was married young and gave everything he had to his wife, Bernice. We were married 68 years. She had Alzheimer's. I, pa I was pastor of Freedom on your Congregationalist Church. I resigned to take care of my wife. He lost her five years ago and turned to the only thing he knew, his faith. And I read section out of each each day. We might have a personal relationship with him. Which, wouldn't you know, is what brought the two together all those years ago. Here's a woman that turned me down to go to a movie, turned me down to go to a ball game, but she went with me to church. Horace still preaches at the local church, and two years ago, he had an idea. He wanted to finally finish his college degree and get it in religion. It just seemed to make sense. A piece of paper didn't mean that much to me back then. But when I started this last time, I started with determination of getting my diploma, and I've got it. <laughs> Here's the catch. He did it all online, because why make things easy? Had you ever used a computer before signing no. up for the online class? No. You had never used a computer? No, and I still have it. He wrote or scribbled every paper by hand. A lot of my papers was past experiences. Jesus willingly submitted. And his the neighbor graciously typed it all out for him to turn in. When he approached me about going back to school, I thought I could do no less. Amanda Branock didn't finish college either, but she saw it as a chance to help and to learn. It was all worth it. I'm happy. It made me feel good. I'd accomplished something. The two now share this really unique bond. And thank you is not enough. And as he nears 89, that may be as important to Horace as this piece of paper that shows he's a college graduate. It's wonderful to have God and know that God is the God of all comfort. I'm Adam Harding, CBS 46 News. By the time the sun finally rose over the Georgia Dome, the party had already started. <laughs> I mean, better than a normal Monday morning, I guess. It's pretty cool, and it's a lot better than school. I have a lot of good memories there, but, you know, I'm, it's sad to see it go. But. They waited. I just want to see it fall down, and I think it's going to be cool. With excitement. I just want to see uh, an explosion. <laughs> it's been such just an iconic piece of Atlanta. I mean. It's sad to see it go, but it's also cool to see a once-in-a-lifetime thing happen where you can see a building go down. For the final countdown. Do we get a countdown? Has anybody been to an implosion before? To say goodbye. Hold it. I thought we got a two-minute warning. Save the dome. To their beloved stadium. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Whoa. Whoa. Holy smokes. Oh, my God. Unbelievable. It just went. From across the city. I actually think I'm a large child. The sounds of cameras clicking, capturing history. The sun was blaring. Yeah, the sun. But, but you know, it was it's worth it. Day. It was definitely <laughs> worth coming out for it. Yeah. If you didn't come out, you missed it. Look at that. It took seconds for the dome to come crumbling down. Look how much smoke there is. 25 years of memories gone. Wow, that is so cool. Look, we are just over here, emergency. 950 uh, West Peachy Street. Somebody just got hit out here. There's a guy who just got hit by a car. He literally killed me. Oh, my God. I was dead, literally dead. Exhale up, inhale down. For Vinny Lorendi. How's your shoulder feeling? You think we can get your arms up above your head today? Strength okay. isn't defined. Pull straight back. By the weights you pull or how fast you move, it's putting in the time every it all out. single deep breath inhale and up day. We've got 25 seconds on the clock and time. Beautiful. Vinny might as well live at the gym. Slow it down, Vinny. As he learns to move again. Good set. 
He has a plate in his left arm. He had surgery on his trachea. How long were we in bed for? He was in a coma. Two months in bed. For weeks. You don't remember anything about the accident? Nothing. Nothing. The active 31-year-old was walking through Midtown back in March when Atlanta police say he was struck by Jason Hardman. According to a police report obtained by CBS 46 Investigates, witnesses saw Hardman run a red light. Surveillance video shows what happened next. He just T-boned me and I hit his windshield and then I went flying. Next thing I knew, I woke up three weeks later in the hospital. Hardman was booked for driving drunk. An investigation found he was arrested only months earlier on similar charges. The report alleging he'd taken six medications, including Valium, before getting behind the wheel and crashing. The officer wrote he seemed unaware and uncaring the accident had occurred. Sadly, what happened to Vinny is not all that uncommon. Attorney Stephen Dermer says what's worse, Hardman was uninsured at the time of the crash. He did not have any automobile insurance, and people like Vinny are left holding the bag. We tried getting Hardman to talk to us. He referred me to his lawyer. I have spent thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars of my own money. I'll be lucky if I see a quarter. CBS 46 Investigates has learned Hardman is active in his church. Staff members here say he sometimes teaches Sunday school. Online, he posts his coursework as he studies theology at Emory University. He even asked if anyone could help him land an internship at a Methodist church, writing, he's putting 2017 in God's hands. He's a hypocrite. I mean, literally, he just is a hypocrite. Vinny's message, start practicing what you preach. Recovery is so expensive, even with insurance. And being the victim, I'm the one that has to pay. As he waits for a trial date. Atlanta's becoming a very walking city. Vinny is changing the direction of his life. So we need to find a way to make these streets safer. Speaking out now on the dangers that can emerge from behind the wheel. I used to say I want my old life back, but right now I'm realizing I want to, I want to be the best version of myself. At the new Mercedes-Benz Stadium. Hello, how y'all doing today? Hello, how you doing? Walter Banks. Hey, good to see you. How you been? Draws as big of a crowd as the football players themselves. Hey there, how you doing? Good to see you. And at 78. How long have you been working with the Falcons? Don't expect that to change. Since day one. This is day one? Anytime soon. September 11, 1966 against the Los Angeles Rams. For as long as the team has been around, there's never been life without Walter. Do you consider yourself lucky? the luckiest sports fan in Atlanta? I do. I, do. I really do. He's worked at 10 stadiums across the city dating back to the 60s, including all three with the Falcons. So there's not a single stadium in Atlanta that you have not worked at? No, now you think about it, I guess not. In total, he'd guess he's worked some 7,000 games. How many stadiums in Atlanta have you been there on opening day? All of them. Every single one. When the Georgia Dome opened and you walked inside for the first time, what was your first reaction? Just about the same when I first walked in Atlanta Stadium. Something new, something fresh, something clean. Working at the Dome and you get to know people, that's a part of it. You know, you have somebody to talk to, people know you, you get to know their families and you see them around and you, you make a lot of friends like that. Sitting in his Southwest Atlanta home, pieces of his history, pieces of his team's history, and tucked away in the back corner, a flag from day one at the Georgia Dome. All-time favorite memory, best thing you ever saw at the Georgia Dome. Every time the Falcons play. Ironically, he never made it to the final game at the Dome last season. The stadium today, nothing but torn apart concrete. It didn't last very long, a little more than two decades dotting the city skyline. If you had a crystal ball and you could look into the future, is there another stadium groundbreaking day one that you're going to be at here in Atlanta? Uh, I would like to be. See, if you're a part of Atlanta enough, you do that enough, you, you're a part of Atlanta enough, 
allow to be a part of you. How you doing today? Good to see you. You're a good friend. <laughs> I love you, Walter. Thank you so much. If I don't see you, happy Thanksgiving. That iconic Star Wars theme song, music to the ears of mega fans all across Atlanta. I think the films are just so relatable and so universally accepted. I initially didn't start collecting until about 83, 84. These are really, really valuable. These are the ones that get up into thousands of dollars. Robert Bean. I have been collecting since 1977. Is known across wow. the metro for his love um, of everything Darth Vader. <laughs> I like Vader because he didn't put up with anything out of anybody. And yes, that's him in head-to-toe armor at a recent convention. And to his left in costume, a key figure in this new Star Wars saga, Carl Cunningham. Carl is kind of behind the scenes, does DVD reviews. The two have been friends for decades. They even took a recent trip together to the coveted Skywalker Ranch. But the Marietta native is now facing felony theft charges. We're here in Northern California. Cunningham's accused of stealing 200 grand in memorabilia from the world's largest known Star Wars collection. We estimate we have about 400,000 separate pieces. Steven Sansweet runs the California warehouse known as Rancho Obi-Wan. To collectors, this is their everything. But deputies out west say Cunningham ransacked the place, then sold some stolen goods for profit. When we initially found out about uh, the theft, it was really devastating. Cunningham is now out on $25,000 bond. That made me sick. I mean, especially knowing all the people involved. We tried getting in touch with him by phone. We're still waiting on a call back. Carl is a really, really nice guy. I mean, you would never think anything like this would happen, that Carl would do anything like this. The alleged crime, like a disturbance in the force for fans. This one has really galvanized the entire community. Star Wars collectors are now banding together. They're working to try and track down the stolen memorabilia. After all, it might be their only hope to getting it back. I think it puts everybody on alert. Tucked away in the basement of this home in Athens. Let's see. Stored in boxes. This is probably the most useless Star Wars figure. Stacked in rows and lining the walls. Jeremy Reeves has more Star Wars figures than he can even count. <laughs> I don't even want to think about that one, to be honest with you. His collection is so big, he calls it his museum. The joke amongst my friends is that Toys R Us always stop here first before going. And, got, yeah, yeah, <laughs> and he's giving us an inside look. I have probably some of my most valuable figures at just this, how valuable these little pieces of plastic really are. This is what I like to call the Holy Grail. That is the vinyl cape Jawa. This guy right here. That guy right there. In the package, he's worth $10,000. Whoa. Yeah. So is it okay that I'm touching this? Yeah. Yep. The YouTube channel has about 330,000 subscribers. Gwyneth's Alex Damon hosts a Star Wars show that's reached close to 67 million viewers. This was about $800. He too uh, is a collector down. and knows the outrage all fans are feeling. From what I can tell, people are surprised and upset. Even the actors are speaking out. Peter Mayhew, Chewbacca himself, writing on Twitter, this is despicable. Luke Skywalker's Mark Hamill with the hashtag the fraud is strong in this one. This one has simply hit the wrong notes for so many. A real life example of good versus bad. In Atlanta, I'm Adam Harding, CBS 46 News. Making me a 911. What is your emergency? This is the call for help. This a girl on live on Facebook has a bag over her head and is inside the tub and trying to commit suicide or something. In the past month in this city of Macon. Yes, she is at her home or somewhere and these people are watching that her live video is going up. Is at 35 now. The haunting reality for one mother. Why didn't I see the signs? Whose identity we're protecting. My greatest fear is for me to bury my any of my children before me. Her 15-year-old daughter live streaming on Facebook her attempted suicide. The report from police, she took a lot of pills, put a plastic bag over her head, then hit record online. 
she felt like she didn't have any friends. She was like, everybody picked on her. Everybody wanted to fight her. It was one thing after another. This is my passion. She survived that, that after Captain going. Shermaine Jones and his team of deputies scoured the city, searching for the home where the teen was live streaming from. Lucky for us at that, at that point, the people that recognized who she was and was calling was, was given address that they knew of. So once they started that process, we just start sending deputies to different addresses trying to figure out which one is the exact address. So Jones says the teen stayed online for nearly an hour. Time is, is precious at that point. She was in, in, a, in a pretty critical condition. Thank the Lord we were able to find her when we did. It's a difficult conversation the Georgia Bureau of Investigation is now asking we all have. It's never too soon to talk about suicide. Special oh. Agent Trevor Randall's focus is on child deaths. Suicide is the second leading cause of death for our kids ages 15 to 17. And the GBI's latest numbers, child suicides across Georgia appear to be on the rise with an all-time high of 51 in 2015. And there's no one particular reason why we no longer call it teen suicide awareness because our children as young as 8, 9, and 10 are committing suicide now. This year alone, 18 kids have taken their own lives, 14 in the last two months. And so they drive you to kill yourself. And sooner the topic later, gaining national out. attention with the recent TV series, 13 Reasons Why, a show documenting the events leading up to a teen suicide. It's prompted some metro school districts to send warning letters to parents urging students to not watch it alone. Anna was crying out for help. The GBI says they have no data linking any recent youth suicide to the show. This is a conversation that definitely needs to be had. This year, agents are now partnering with teachers to let them know it's okay to talk about this. How else do you make the community aware of why our children are dying if you're not talking about it? And on these city streets... A lot of people don't want to talk about it. I do. One family is already beginning the dialogue. This is nothing that we can run from. It can happen to anyone. Netflix, we should mention, told me that they'll be changing how they warn their viewers about that show, 13 Reasons Why. They hope it creates a conversation. If you or someone you know needs help, you can call 1-800-273-8255. We have put resources on our website, cbs46.com, and in the next 20 minutes or so, we'll be doing a live Facebook conversation. I'm Adam Harding, CBS 46 News. These are the quiet moments at Clara Harrington's home. And this is where she and her husband would share the not so quiet ones. This is Jimmy, that's not what he looked like on game day, but that's a pretty good photo. Clara can still hear her husband cheering. She can still remember their first game together at the Georgia Dome. It was August 23rd, 1992, and I remember that because it was my husband's birthday. Season ticket holders from day one, section 214. She's not yet ready for this stadium to go. I mean, it was built the same year this house was. So. She has a lot of memories there. It was still good. A lot. But, you know, the memories are here. They're not in a building. This one's really cool. This is all the signatures of the 1966 Falcons. The family's never known Sundays without football. They're only now getting used to Sundays without Jimmy. He died in December 2014 from a rare cancer. They said he had two to four years and he lived almost 10, so we, we felt pretty fortunate. It kind of worked out, and then chemo and radiation and surgery all were kind of done off season. Just worked out that way. So he would still go to games. He went to as many games as he could until one day he just couldn't anymore. The Dome is such a special place. I've got a lot of memories there. Yeah, I love the Dome. That's like the place I love to watch football the most. It's going to be pretty sad seeing it go, for sure. These are Jimmy's two sons. John graduated high school last year. His ceremony happened to be at the Dome. He thought Dad would want to be with him on the field, so he was. I put a little, like, envelope in my sock. Then when I was sitting out and they were just calling names, I just dumped it a little bit. That was it. It was nice. The team only weeks later started winning like never before. There was a couple plays on the 20 yard line where I kind of was like, well, that might have been him. The Falcons' final season under the dome. I'm a believer. I really am. A few games in, a family member grabbed a marker 
And behind the seats they've shared for decades, a friend wrote two simple words on the concrete wall. Hey, Jimmy. It started with he wrote Hey, Jimmy on the wall. And then as more people go throughout the weeks into the, into the uh, playoffs that season, just more and more people would all sign their names. So it kind of became a, like a big collaboration. So fitting. Nothing fancy. Just kind of cool and just kind of happened. I think that was just kind of way he lived his life. Soon, the number of messages grew. Love you, Dad. Miss you. This made me feel like he was really loved and everybody really missed him. And Atlanta finished its final game here with a trip to the Super Bowl. And when we beat Green Bay to go to the Super Bowl, we were just like, that's not a coincidence. She thought it would be the last time she'd ever see the wall. But what Clara didn't know, we went looking for Jimmy's wall amid the debris. We not only found it, we asked construction crews to cut it out and they did. This ended up being the final play ever at the Georgia Dome. We found the piece. No kidding. And we're going to present it to you. Oh, oh my gosh. A moment for this family better than any championship. It's just so special. And it means so much that so many people wanted to be involved in it. Clara always had a lot of memories here. And then we made the playoffs. And then everybody wanted in. A lot. This is the guy that started it all right here. That one day. Wow. wow. <laughs> that is so amazing.